Tonight I'm going to talk about beautiful code, writing code that's easy to read. So a little bit about me. I'm Ryan Stilley. I work at a company called Conductic Swampler. We make crane parts. We power pretty much anything that moves. People movers, escalators, uh, trams, Las Vegas monorail, stuff like that. I am passionate about programming. I have a blog at stillnutstudios.com and I also run the techomaha.com site, which we talked about a little bit. It's an event calendar for user groups. And I enjoy taking trips on my motorcycle. So why do we care about readable code? Um, well, when you, need, when you spend time uh, trying to understand your code, of course that costs you time, which costs you money. So if we can write something that's simpler and easier to understand, that's good for everybody. Very few of us are lone developers where we're writing, we're the only one reading and writing our own code. Usually we work with some other people who either read our code or we have to read their code. Or sometimes, even if you are a lone developer, you, when you come back to code two, uh, several weeks or months or years later, you might think to yourself, who the heck wrote this? So sometimes it feels like some, you're working with somebody else when you look at your old code. So uh, simplicity is good even if you work by yourself. Um, so servers, the disk-based CPU is pretty cheap nowadays, but developers are still pretty expensive. So if we can maximize our time spent in development being pr productive instead of trying to figure out what our code is doing, that's good. And I also put here sanity. I mean, for myself, I find to get a lot more job satisfaction when I'm able to spend my time creating new things <clears throat> rather than scratching my head trying to figure out what was this guy trying to, trying to write here, what is this code doing. So what we're going to talk about are variable and function names, how to make those clear, talk about using helper methods to make things more understandable, some code formatting ideas, talk about conditionals and flow, your, your logic and comparisons, <clears throat> talk about comments, and then a few more random thoughts at the end. So variable and function names. You want to be descriptive. I and J are not good choices for variable names. We see those a lot in, in loops for counters, <clears throat> which I think they're actually OK if you have a loop that's only a couple lines long. I think the, uh, the shortness, the generalness of a variable name is OK in opposite proportion to the length that that variable has to exist in your mental stack as you're thinking about it. So if you have a loop that's only four lines long, it's probably OK to call it I. But if it's more than a screen full and you've got to scroll by, you want to use something else. So if you're looping through users, for example, you might want to use user count or something, something instead of I. Camel case, camel case, of course, helps. Yes, definitely. Yep. For readability, that helps. Camel case. Uh, also, you want to be short when you can. So if you can, if you can shorten a variable and it can still convey as much meaning as a longer one, then you're being concise, and that's a good thing. And also, you want to be consistent. So run into this in our code sometimes where if you have a variable or a form field called first name, you want to be sure to reference that as first name. When you create a new form that's also dealing with the user, don't call it F name. It's going to be consistent. So here's some examples of, of not so good and, and better variable names. So uh, I was working on some search code where it passed in what the user had typed in for the search term and it just called it text. A uh, more clear name might be search term. If you have a variable called length, a more descriptive version of that might be runway length feet. Um, authenticated could contain a lot of things, but is authenticated is a little more clear. And I think you know it's a Boolean indicating if they're authenticated or not. Instead of date, we could do create date or last updated date or uh, delete date. You know, what, what is that date? Instead of size, we could do file size bytes. So there I've not only described what I'm measuring the file, but the unit that it's measured in also. So that makes comparisons easy. And instead of limit, maybe let's, let's talk what we're really limiting. Maybe that's max downloads per day. So I also talked about making them short. So here's my example of runway length feet. In our application, we really only measure the the length of a runway. So I can probably get by just calling that runway feet there. And number of search engines might be better expressed as num engines or number engines or engine count maybe. And then this last one is a real variable from my code at work. Transaction, type ID, SAP, where create material. <coughs> 
I don't know what you'd shorten that one to, but that one's pretty bad. I just created that one. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering if Rod did that. So. Uh, all right, and, and descriptive names. Uh, so, so here's a function called check user expire. This is very similar to some real code I had to work on a few years ago that somebody gave me. And it took me a little bit to figure out what check user expired does. Does it return true if the user is expired? Or does it return true if the user is not expired, if they're valid? Well, if you dig through the code, you might be able to figure it out that here we're saying, sorry, your account is expired, so this must return true when they're expired. But if it were written like this, it's pretty clear. You don't have to spend time digging through the code to see what that does. Is user expired? That's a little more clear. So some more examples of, of variable naming. This is some code that I think Rob maybe did work on. Um, so I was going through this the other day, trying to figure out what this send email flag did. And at first I just thought, OK, send email one. This is probably Boolean indicating whether they're going to get an email or not. And then later I found that send email is sometimes set to two, and also other values in other places. So obviously it's not just a yes, no flag. So after I dug in the code, I was able to figure out it indicates what type of email they're going to get. So a more, more clear way to express that might be call it email template, and then maybe use a string. So here this is very clear that in this block, the user is going to get an assignment email. And in this block, they're going to get a work complete email. So another example of variable naming, taking, taking a look at this code here, um, we call a function called get material details, assign that to material details, pass in a bunch of things. I was working on something where this SAP ID wasn't quite right, and SAP ID is kind of like a user ID in our system, and I saw that we were passing in this SAP ID. That's, that really doesn't tell me a lot, so I had to dig through the code and figure out that up here, we're fetching a zombie from the zombie service, get zombie. I won't go into what zombies are, but they're very important to our operation. So then from the zombie, we call get SAP ID and put that into this SAP ID. So this is really just the SAP ID of a zombie. So a more clear, to, clear way to express that might be just call this zombie SAP ID. And then when you read this code here, you know exactly what's, what's happening. I think, I think the programmer probably used this. They're following some convention, maybe, but the first person who did that probably was just trying to differentiate between SAP ID. It's some, sometimes why we name variables with a 2 or a 3 at the end, which is also kind of confusing. All right, any questions on that stuff so far or comments? All right. So helper functions. I found this definition of a helper function in, a, in the Scala book. A function whose purpose is to provide a service to one or more other functions nearby. Helper functions are often implemented as local functions. In Confusion, we might say they're often implemented as private functions, which is a good point. Um, when I break code, when I separate code into helper functions just for the sake of clearing up the main function, I'm not necessarily doing it for code reuse, I always mark that helper function as private. That way, when you come back into it and you need to refactor a little bit, make it take more or less arguments, you you know that there's no other code in your system calling that method except other methods in that one component. So the help us focus on what's important by moving chunks of not so important code to other methods. We can focus on just what's happening and not how it's happening. And it's also good for code reuse, of course. I'll talk about that. So here's an example. Uh, this method is called process invoice. It takes an invoice and it's created by user ID. This is something we use that sends an invoice to the Mexican government. They want to keep track of any transaction that happens in Mexico. So whenever we sell something, we have to send a copy of the invoice to them through this XML thing. So if you're going to work on this and you're going to try and understand it, go through it and you'll see that create an empty invoice XML variable. And we use CF content to put some more, uh, to put some content in that variable. We start building the XML here. There's a bunch of logic about do certain things inside the XML. Once that's complete, we convert it to base64. So now we have this in a base64 format. 
Then we create another variable using save content, create the soap header, and in the middle of that, put the base64 encoded invoice. And then we use CFHTTP to send this invoice to the Mexican government. And then with what comes back from that, we use XML search to, to parse out that XML and get back this folio and then save the folio. And now we're done. So this can be cleaned up a little bit, I think, with, the, with some helper methods. So here's, here's another version of it. It's the process invoice takes the invoice and it created by it. But now, uh, to, to build our XML, instead of doing it all in line here, we just call it make XML. It returns us the XML. <clears throat> then we have a function called send soap request, which takes that XML and it returns the folio, and then we save folio. So now at a glance here, you can pretty easily understand what this function does. This makes it easier to troubleshoot too, because you can dump it or abort it here and see what's going in and out and isolate where your problem is and then focus on that function. And you can also write your own test harness to just call that one function and test it. So. So like I mentioned, helper functions are also great for code reuse. So here's, here's some code we use to pull data out of SAP. So this data from SAP comes out as this instantiated Java class, class data structure. So rather than our whole application have to know how those work, we always convert them into a cold fusion query right away. So that's what this code is doing. Uh, we create an addresses query here, a query new. We're going to create a query object. This addresses detail is a reference to the table from SAP. This order adder detail is the SAP table. So then we loop through the data in that from one to get num rows. And for each row, we create a new query row and then use query set cell to, to pluck the data out of the SAP data object here and put it into the ColdFusion query. So we have code like this all over our application. Every time we pull customers or materials or orders, anything, we have to do this to it. So, so the purpose is to get it out of the proprietary SAP, the, the object version yeah. that SAP provides and get it into something familiar. Yep, something that the rest of the app can work with e easily. Yep. So this is a prime candidate for a helper function to, to clean things up. So we, we have this code all over. So this is what it looks like now with my new helper function. Like before, we pull a reference to get table order addresses out and put that in address detail. But now, instead of all that looping and everything ourselves, we just call this helper method called make query from BAPI table. And we pass it the address detail reference. And then a structure here called columns. The structure is the columns that we want to pull out of it and what to name them. So let me go back here. You know, sometimes we rename these to be a little more clear than what the SAP name is. So for example, tel one numbr we pull back as telephone and postal COD1, we pull as postal code. So we, we do that here in the new version too. We say pull out postal COD1 and call it postal code, etc. Okay. If you don't map them, does it like default to the whatever's there? Or no, there, there, there's often so much data there that I, I didn't make a default mode where it would just pull everything. You, you have to tell it what you want. So this is gonna this is gonna clean up thousands of lines from our code base, and make it a lot more readable, where we can scan through and instead of having to skip past all that looping code, you know, it's just this one block here that handles that for us. So you can also make things more clear by lining stuff up. So here I have some JavaScript. Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty simple stuff, so we're grabbing some elements that are named dynamically. We tack on a value here and then pull the value of those elements out and put them into some JavaScript variables. So this isn't too bad to read, but if you look like this, it's just a lot more pretty. So if you have a lot of JavaScript code, this can really make a difference of being able to scan through it and see what things are doing. You can do something similar with the CF switch. Um, so if you were tasked to come in here and find out what the CR branch was doing, you scan through this code and find the CR here, and you can say, oh, okay, it's, that's a credit memo request. But it's a little easier to read. Sometimes if I just have one line inside of my CF case, I just do it all in one line like this here. 
So now it's a lot easier to go find your CR. And because they're all lined up here, you can see what it's set to. And it's we can do a little better than that though. So this version down here I've lined up to CF sets even. So I think that's just easier to read. You do that a lot? Um, you know, I used to do that a lot at other jobs. At this one, nobody did it in the code base, so I really haven't. But I've done it in other code bases, and I think it helped a lot. So let's talk about conditionals a little bit. So you guys go ahead and read through both of those statements and tell me which one's easier to, to understand. First one or second? Second one. Right, see if, if age is greater than 18. That's easier to understand than if 18 less than or equal to age, which is which matches our natural English language. You wouldn't say to somebody, you can't, you can't enter if 18 is less than or equal to your age. You'd say, you can't enter unless you're over 18. So in, in general, if you put the variable you're interrogating on the left-hand side, things will read more clear. So this is something we, we do a lot, we say if something, do something else, do something else. So we can make those easier to read by handling <coughs> the positive option first or handling the simpler option first. So for example, let's look at these two versions. If not user has funds, we throw an error message, else finalize the transfer. Versus if user has funds, finalize the transfer else throw an error message. That second one reads a little better, right? A little easier to understand. So if we put your positive, if you rewrite it to be able to put your positive version up front. What? Oh, where'd, where'd that go? How's that? Three is the same way. What are you using for your slide presentation? This is deck.js. It's JavaScript. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, so another way we can make things more clear is by returning early. Have you guys heard of this before? Returning early? Yeah. So this first example is not returning early. And then we'll look at one that's returning early and see how, how it makes it more clear. So this is a method called process transaction. It takes an account ID and an amount. So the first thing we do is make sure we have a valid account ID. So if it's not zero, we're going to continue on. Then we're going to check to see if this account is blocked at all. We're going to get the blocks here. And if blocks.rec account is zero, if there's no blocks, then we'll continue on. We'll fetch the balance. And then if the balance is greater than the amount, we will do whatever work has to happen to process that transaction. And then we return true to indicate everything went okay. Else, we return false because the balance wasn't enough. Or we return false because there was blocks. Or we return false because we didn't have a valid account ID passed to us. So as you have more and more checks, you get more complex. You get further and further nested in. It gets harder to keep track of where you're at. And also, if you're doing something a little more complex than just returning false, then you've got companion code down below. And, and this code ends up being so far away from your, your comparison up above, it just gets very confusing. And I don't know if this has happened to you guys before, but sometimes I end up where I've, where I've done this and I've lost a CFF, and now, and now it's not right. And it takes quite a while to go figure out how did I screw that up, which one is missing, and where does it go. So returning early cleans that up a little bit. A lot of times I'll grab the if statement, bring it down, and put, put a remark around it so I know what I called the first time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've seen people do that. That helps. It's ugly, but... <laughs> so here's a version where we're returning early. Um, the first thing we do is check that if, if we don't have a valid account ID, we return false. Next, we check for blocks, and if there are some, so opposite of before, if there are blocks, then we return false. Then we check the balance, and if the balance is less than the amount, we return false. And finally, if we're still here, everything must be okay. So we do the work, and then return true. So I think if I flip back, that ends up being just a little longer code, a little more code, but 
I think it's a lot easier to read. And, and as you have more checks, you more, have more white space in the other example. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I, I like that method too when you, you, you quit using the else's and you just you set it and then you run an if and, and the if mm -hmm. supersedes what you set in the first place. Yep. So here's an example where we're doing something similar except in a loop. Uh, I, we have a lot of these at work where we're looping through and working on things, and we have to do uh, several checks inside the loop to see if we should continue. So for example here, we're looping over a query of users. First thing we do is see if they are, if they are not deleted. So if the deleted flag is zero, then they're not deleted, so we continue. We get their pending uploads, pass in a user ID. Uh, if they have pending uploads, if, the, if they have a record count of pending uploads, then we process the uploads and get that in a variable called result and then check result.error if that's false if there was no errors then we call and we put that user ID into an array of finished users to so keep track of which ones we processed this is kind of confusion specific but do you think it's cleaner not to have the greater than zero um, yes I do you mean like this yeah. yeah I usually write it that way without the greater than yes I think it's I think not that's more quite clear, as clear but I mean, if you have to understand it. Yeah, I think a general rule is if there's less code to read in general, that's simpler. So I pull that out and just say if record count instead of if record count is equal to another value. So we couldn't really return early out of this until Cold Fusion 9 when Adobe added the CF continue tag. And boy, was I happy to see that. I've been waiting for that since I started doing Cold Fusion programming. So CF continue is oddly named, it does not continue. In my mind, it skips. It does not continue through the code, it skips. But So, so here's an example of uh, using CF continue. So, so we check for the opposite condition. If deleted equals one. If they are deleted, then we CF continue. And what that does is it does not continue through the rest of the code. It just iterates to the next, it skips to the next iteration of the loop. That it boards out. So then we check for pending uploads. And if record count is zero, if we don't have any, we CF continue. That's new in 9? Yeah, it was in 9. Then we process the uploads, and if there was an error, then we CF continue. So just jump to the next iteration. Else, we're at the end, everything must have been okay, so we do our array append of finished users. Any questions on that? All right, comments. Does everybody here write comments? Anybody not write comments? Believe it or not, I know one guy who wrote a regular expression to go through his code and remove all his comments. <laughs> but and he's in the room tonight. <laughs> but uh, was me. I did it before. I love comments. I I that's one of the things I look through when uh, looking at code samples from people is to see how how they've documented their code. So in some cases, your code will end up being self-documenting and it doesn't need a comment. We'll talk about that a little bit. Also, you don't want to comment the obvious. So x equals 1, you don't need a comment for that. So what do you want to comment? We want to com comment the why, the business logic, the reason why you did something here. Think about if you were to print out this code and hand it to somebody and expect them to understand it, what would you need to tell them besides just your code to understand it? And something else about comments, you don't want to check in code that's commented. Use your version control system for that. That just makes your code ugly. You have to scroll through big blocks of commented code. It also will trip up your searches if you're searching your code base to see if a variable is still in use or something. You'll, you'll get a hit on that commented code. And you want to know that it's commented until you go in there because your find doesn't comprehend commented code. So. Hey, back to CF continue. Yeah. Does it work with a CF loop? Variable works with CF loop and CF query too. Uh, you mean CF output? Oh yeah, CF output. That's a good question. I I assume it does work with CF output. I don't know if I've used it in that way. I think it does. <laughs> and also, don't forget about the hint attribute in your cold fusion functions and arguments. I think those are very helpful. Unless you copy and paste them to create another function and you don't change the hints, then it's not helpful. You have a bunch of functions that say they do the same thing. And I've run into that. That's frustrating. All right, so here's some four examples of comments that you don't need to do. 
Um, if you're ever commenting this, set x to 1, don't do that. That's bad. Um, save the customer. So this is something, this is a, a, some self-documenting code. So here we're calling customer service dot save customer and passing in a customer bean. It's pretty obvious what's happening here. We're saving the customer. So you, you do not need a comment to save the customer here. That would depend on how well the variables are. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. So here I can see this code is CFHTP. It's fetching something, my bank, latest rates at XLS. This, this really isn't very helpful. Fetch the latest rates. I think we got that. Then this is one I just saw at work. I think yesterday I added this and saw it at work and thought there's an example for my slide about poor comments. This is CF loop query equals plants and the comment is loop through each plant. <laughs> so now we don't need that either. So this is subjective of course, but here's some examples of what I think are good comments. So these first three lines are from a CFC where it was passed a config object and it's it's plucking some values out of that config object and setting them to local variables. So this is CF set variables dot remote drawing mapping equals config dot get remote drawing mapping. Well, it's kind of self-documenting code. It's obviously a remote drawing mapping, but I still don't really know what that is. The comment helps out a lot. The mapping is a UNC path to access the SAP server. Now I know exactly what that is. Something similar with remote drawing path. Um, I kind of have an idea what that is, but not really. This tells me it's the actual local path on the remote server. Well, that helps. And this one, file finder path, tells me this is where drawing files will be moved to when step 8 is complete. So, those are some good comments. And this last one here, this is also kind of self-documenting. It's calling this method called send ER message. I, I know it's going to send a message about an ER but this makes it extra clear. Send the engineer an email to let him know that a request has been assigned to him. So now I know why we put that in there. Not just the fact that we're sending him an email, but why. So commenting your business logic is always a good thing too. Here we have a loop. Looping through materials, checking the UOM on each material, and if it's ST, set it to PC. No, I mean, if I were reading through that code, I, I comprehend it. I know what's happening there, but I might not really understand why. But this tells me German ST must be translated to PC, peace, for our English users. ST means peace in German. Uh, here's another one where if I were to look through this code, I see that we're getting a total attachment size, comparing it to this number, and then if it's greater than that number, we delete the files and then throw an error about too many files selected, attachment size is too large. So imagine you get a request from your user where he's getting this error. He's trying to send a report that attaches files and he's getting this error. He says, I, I need to be able to send a whole month's worth of files. Can you go please remove this limit and stop telling me it's too large? So you come in here and you find this code and you see exactly what's happening here. We do a check and we throw an error instead of sending and you think, well, I don't know why they did that. Maybe it was because when this was written, 10 megs was a big, was a large attachment, but now I have no problem. I'll bump it up to 15 for him. Well, if we had this comment here, you would read that if the attachment, if the size of the attachments is greater than 10 meg, then our exchange server won't accept the email. So that's a pretty good reason to leave that alone. So documenting the business logic there. So what happens if exchange allows 15 now, like 2000? Well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a configuration setting. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if they allow that, then you could change the code and you'd probably update the comment. Yeah, I didn't know if the comment would be outdated eventually. It would if you went here and changed this without changing without this. Changing comment, yep. Yeah, yep. So I guess if you wanted to get around that, of having that tied to that, that could be out of date, you, you could write this better. You could say, it's it, not it, you could say if the size of the attachments is, is, is too large, then our exchange server won't accept it. And the too large is described right here. Very easy to put in the email address of the exchange administrator. Call him. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Talk to Bob about this problem. Uh, a few more thoughts. So I think we kind of covered this, and you've probably heard it many times before. You want, you want your code to do one thing and do it well. You want to break it into small enough pieces that it's only handling one thing and that'll result in clear code and also easy code that's easier to reuse and code that's easier to test. And on writing code that isn't needed, wait to write the code till you actually need it. 
Uh, that may that may feel obvious, right? Who writes code that we don't need? But it does happen. So I, I read about this programmer named Max who was given this task of, of speeding up this process where his users would log into the application and hit a button to send emails to all their customers. And it would loop through and send all those emails and the user had to wait while the system was looping through and sending all those emails. So they put in a request to, to fix that. So what Max is going to do is, is batch that off. So the user hits the go button and then he fires off a batch process in the background that loops to those emails and sends them. So that's a great thing. But he decided to make this a really cool system where you could, where other programmers could write plugins for this batch system. And so we could later move other batch uh, tasks into this system. Well, it turned out nobody ever wrote plugins to use Max's batch system. And in fact, by him doing that, it made it overly complex that there was bugs sometimes and it was harder to troubleshoot. And it ended up taking longer than it should have. And there was more code there than really needed to be. So. I kind of used to work that way, and I've kind of come around to start just writing it the minimum code we need to get this thing out there, and then we'll adjust later. So if there's some takeaways from tonight, think about that when we write, we're communicating in our code. We're communicating for a human and the computer, and the computer is a lot better at reading code than humans are, so keep that in mind and write for the human. And you want to place a priority on simplicity. It takes some extra time and effort at the beginning, but I think it definitely pays off in the long run. Can you go back a slide, Craig? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry, if you would do this, you could almost take that removed code that isn't being used to make it its own bullet point. That's one of the biggest things I see. People are versioning software, you guys will comment stuff out. Comment an old query out, write the new version of the query, and leave it there. Mm -hmm. So any other questions up to this point or comments? So the resources that I used for this were mostly these three books. And I have, I have all three of them here tonight, so you can take a look at them. And I thought we'd do a drawing. And if you win, you can pick whatever, whatever one of these you want. So this was probably the best, my favorite. This was a really good one. Um, this one's really thin. It's an easy read on code simplicity. And this one is, is less, less not, not quite so much about code, more about uh, programming as a profession. But it does have some code things in there. It talks about how to deal with users, and that's some good stuff. So that was everything. Any other questions? Or? All right, thanks.